Welcome to our second presentation on Chapter 21, which is the chapter that talks about the various forms of business organization. We were last together, we discussed five different business forms. Let me flip to the uh, slide 15 so we can see those. We've covered sole proprietorship, general partnership, then the three partnership, sorry, uh, sole proprietorship, then three partnership forms, the first being general partnership, then limited partnership, then limited liability partnership, and finally we covered the limited liability company. Now we're ready to talk about corporations, and we will also discuss uh, some uh, more specialized forms of business entities after we cover corporations. Once you uh, uh, begin, if you haven't already, uh, working for a large employer, almost certainly that employer will be a corporation. Um, once a business gets beyond the small size um, company, and a small size company can naturally be having revenues um, in, in the low millions, uh, so we're not talking that small, um, but, but once a company moves from that size to a mid-range size, um, it is going to want to be a corporation. Um, that is uh, the size that is scalable at that point. And so definitely the corporation is the most important business structure for non-small entities. Just like we might say that an LLC is by far the most common choice for um, small businesses when they're starting out, um, we would certainly expect a, a business that is moving beyond the small business stage to be a corporation. So let's consider for a second what a corporation is, and here's our definition. It is a legal entity formed by issuing stock to investors who are the owners of the corporation. So we have two names for investors, we can call them Investors or shareholders, we can also call them stockholders. Those are kind of the, the terms, but whichever one of these terms we use, we mean the owners of the company. So the way that an owner becomes an owner of a corporation is by buying shares of the stock. That is fundamentally different than all the other forms that we've been talking about at this point. Um, these, these individuals, well, I guess that the, the closest comparison would be a limited partner in a limited partnership. Um, but, but even there, you're not talking about issuing stock. There isn't that much a social distance or, or, or a legal distance from, from the entity, even in that case. Okay, so we're going to talk about two types of corporations. We're going to talk about um, a typical corporation. I'm put, calling it a normal corporation, but uh, that name somehow suggests that um, another type of corporation is abnormal. <laughs> well, no, of course. Um, the, the, the typical corporation is a C corporation, and the C uh, doesn't stand for anything as far as I know. I think it just stands for corporation, um, but the, the reason that we call them C corps um, um, is that uh, we have another type of corporation, the uh, somewhat atypical corporation, that's an S-corp. An S-corporation is called an S-corporation because of subchapter S of the um, Internal Revenue Code. And the reason that subchapter S is called subchapter S is because it's, it is immediately before subchapter T, um, and right after subchapter R. So it doesn't have any meaning other than alphabetical order. So it doesn't stand for something like small. Although if that helps you remember, you certainly can remember it that way. An S corporation by definition is a relatively small corporation. A C corporation can be a small corporation, but it can also be you know, um, Exxon or, or a, a very, very big, big corporation. Okay, so the investors, the shareholders, the stockholders, whatever you want to call them, are the owners of the corporation. And they can be uh, a single person, or they can be a small group of people, or they can be millions and millions of people. Individuals, human beings can be shareholders, but also entities can be shareholders. A common entity to hold shares of a corporation are um, uh, uh, retirement accounts, retirement entities, like a uh, um, 
uh, let's see, what is it called? The, the uh, pension fund for California CalPERS. Um, that's a big one. Um, uh, entities that have a lot of money that are looking for how to place things, they, they oftentimes are involved in investments, but it can be any number of, of entities that invest. And the, the nature of the relationship can be very, very close. For example, if you have a small corporation with, say, five shareholders, those five shareholders may come to work every day and work 40 hours a week for the business. Um, from a day-in, day-out perspective, they may look very much like members in an LLC. That's certainly a possibility with a corporation. On the other extreme, you can have Walmart, wherein uh, most Walmart shareholders um, have, don't work at a Walmart, never did work for a Walmart, don't do anything other than own the shares of Walmart. They, you know, went to their um, a broker and said, I want to buy X number of shares of Walmart. And most likely they wanted to buy Walmart sh shares, not because necessarily that they love Walmart or that they were excited about a particular product Walmart was was rolling out or doing in the marketplace, but more likely they saw it as just a financial investment. Well, I could buy Exxon shares, I could buy Walmart, I could buy McDonald's, I could invest in bonds, I could keep my money in cash, um, it, but I think my highest rate of return combined with uh, the investment vehicle that is consistent with my uh, risk uh, status, all of that has led me to think Walmart is the right entity for me. And as soon as that shareholder decides, you know what, Walmart isn't the right mix for me, either because my circumstances have changed or Walmart circumstances are changed, that investor is going to get right out. It's an in-out, very quick thing. Um, uh, that stock is going to turn, you know, so many times during the course of a day. So if I am a shareholder in a corporation, either model, the small one or the big one, what is my liability circumstance? Well, my liability circumstance is the same as it is with the, these, let me just go ahead and is the same as it is with these three, or yeah, well, uh, assuming I'm a limited partner in the limited partnership. My liability is limited to the amount of my investment. It's even more true with corporations than it is with these vehicles because in these situations, and I'm going to exempt this one here for a second, I'm probably, as an owner, I'm probably in the mix here. I'm probably doing stuff in the business. And as we've already discussed, if I am a member of the LLC and I'm the one who is uh, preparing the food in my restaurant and I leave out the food and cause it to spoil and I make lots of people sick. Well, um, it is true that the people who got sick can't sue me as an owner beyond my level of investment, but because me, Cynthia Groover, um, met, made them sick, they can sue me as Cynthia Groover as the bad cook um, and get all of my personal assets. So uh, my status as owner, only the amount of investment is in jeopardy, but because I am involved in the day in, day out of business, I can still mess up and I can still have my personal uh, wealth in jeopardy. But if I am an investor in the corporation and I don't have any other connection to it, for example, I'm not an employee or an officer um, or a director of the corporation, I just happen to want to buy that shares of stock and I invest, let's say the shares of the company that I'm buying is $100 a share and I decide to buy 2,000 shares. Okay, so I've invested $200,000. $200, that company, four weeks later, files for bankruptcy, liquidates, and uh, there's no money left over at the end for me to get any money. I'm not going to get my $2,000. But let's say, even after liquidation, not only does it, have, does, does it lack any money to pay its shareholders anything, but it also owes its creditors still a lot of money. Um, those creditors can't come to me and say, hey, Groover, um, you are a shareholder in this corporation that is now defunct. Um, we, in addition to the 200000 that you lost, we want you to pay us $3 more, million more. We know you have it. You're a wealthy woman. Go ahead and pay us that money. 
Well, I could pay them the money, but I don't have to pay them the money. My exposure is limited to the amount that I've invested. But I do want to clarify one point, and that is, I can, in addition to being a shareholder, I can be an employee of the corporation. I can be a director. I can be an officer. Um, I can have all of those roles. And of course, if I am a shareholder and a director and I do something that um, causes harm to people, I can be sued just like anyone else on the planet. So it's not some kind of, you know, magic pixie dust that being a, a shareholder uh, somehow confers upon me some superhuman powers to avoid uh, legitimate lawsuits. So it's only when the only basis of my responsibility would be my ownership interest that I am in fact limited to um, the exposure that I have because I, uh, the amount of my investment. Okay, so we've talked about Share, we've talked about the liability. Let's talk about taxation. This is up until this point, all of the entities we've talked about, without exception, even including these top ones, have enjoyed pass through taxation treatment, meaning that the entity itself does not pay taxes on the profits that it makes. Instead, that profit, when it's distributed to the partners or to the members or to the owners, whatever we call those people, um, those individuals uh, declare that income. So there is just one taxing event for that income, and it is borne by the owners. Corporations are different, and this is a, a pretty significant uh, downside to corporations. And what corporations experience is double taxation. Um, the first thing that happens is when a corporation earns a profit is that the corporation itself pays a tax on that profit. Okay, so let's say that we have a corporation. The corporation has earned, we'll say, $100,000 in taxes. I mean, excuse me, in profit. And let's say its effective corporate tax rate is 10%. So it's going to pay, so it's going to uh, need to pay $10,000 in taxes. So that means that its amount of profit that is available to distribution to the partners is only $90,000. Because obviously, if we take ten ten thousand dollars, we subtract. Excuse me, one hundred thousand dollars. We subtract ten thousand dollars. We get ninety thousand dollars. Well, let's say that we have ten shareholders, and let's say each one owns the same number of shares of stock. So each one is going to get nine thousand dollars, assuming that all the profits are distributed. Now that might not happen. It might be that some profits are being reinvested in the business. But we'll assume, just for the sake of ease of this communicate this uh, example, that all the profits are distributed. And so now I've just been awarded $9,000 in profits. Probably this will be paid out as a dividend to me. Um, now I might be thinking to myself, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to do so many cool things with this money. I'm so excited. But then I realize, oh, wait a second, I'm going to have to declare this money as uh, my earnings. And so th there's a special tax rate for it. But let's say that the tax rate that applies under my circumstances is going to be I have to pay 20%. So that means that I'm going to pay $1,800 in tax. I'm sorry, sorry, wrong comma there. So that means I only get to keep $7,200. And let's assume that everyone else has the same effective tax rate. So everyone in total ends up uh, spending to eighteen thousand dollars more in taxes. So the federal government gets, since we're in Texas, we don't have state taxes. So the federal government gets a total of twenty-eight thousand dollars in income from this ten thousand. I mean, one hundred thousand dollar profit. So the effective tax rate is twenty-eight percent. 10% on the corporate level, 20% on the individual level. And you might say, well, why isn't it 30% um, uh, effective tax rate? Why is it 28%? And the reason it's not 30% is that the individual doesn't have to pay taxes on the money 
that the corporation paid in taxes. So you know how you're not taxed on your taxes, in other words. So you can see that this is a pretty significant tax rate. Ordinarily, if there's only pass-through taxation, only one tax event, this number would be smaller. That doesn't always follow. It's possible that even when you have two taxing events, that the end of the day, the effective tax rate can actually be uh, lower with two taxes than with one, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time, a double tax rate means that um, Uncle Sam is getting a larger piece of the pie. And of course, if, when the Uncle Sam's getting a bigger piece, it means that the investor is getting a smaller piece. And that can be a very significant part of the calculation of a business about whether they want to become a corporation or be an LLC or something like that. It's not a happy thing to have double taxation. But there is a potential fix for this problem for some corporations, for some smaller corporations. And this is this S corporation status. Now I will tell you that the textbook doesn't do a very good job, in my opinion, of describing this. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because this isn't a major focus of the, the course, and I'm not a tax person or a corporate attorney, so it's a little bit outside of my um, wheelhouse, but um, just so you'll know that the textbook doesn't do the best job describing this. So let's first of all talk a little bit about what an S corporation is. Well, I've already mentioned you know how it got its name it's because of the IRS um, but you may when I said that you might have been thrown a little bit by it you might have thought to yourself well Groover you went through telling us earlier about how these business entities are all set up to the state of Texas why are you now talking about the federal government that seems like a disconnect you were right to identify that as an issue um, business entities are creatures of state law they are not creatures of federal law so why the heck does the IRS code have anything to do with that? Well, it really doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, a corporation is just a corporation. Um, it, a C corporation and S corporation from a state law perspective are exactly the same uh, creature, so to speak. And obviously not literally a creature, but a metaphoric creature, we'll say. Um, but, as I say, tax planning is a big, big issue in um, entity selection as well as just the overall structure of a corporation. Um, the corporations uh, have accountants for lots of reasons, but one is to hopefully, through their uh, smart and prudent decisions, uh, they hope to uh, and usually are successful at reducing the tax burden of the corporation, um, not through un unlawful actions, but through lawful uh, tax planning um, approaches. And so uh, the entity type, the corporation is determined by the, the, the uh, state law selection that happened um, with the state, a secretary of state option, you know, what entity was selected. But now that you select a corporation, there is an additional choice that can be made, and that choice is under federal law. And if your entity or if your corporation satisfies the requirements of uh, subchapter S, then it can become an S corporation and it will get certain federal income tax advantages as a result of that status. Uh, but just to be clear, there is no S corporation under state law, um, and this is a, a creature of the federal law system. Okay, and so what an S corporation can do, again, we'll talk about the qualifications for in a second, is that it can have pass-through taxation status. So it can be, for tax purposes, similar to an LLP, an LP, a general partnership and a sole proprietorship. Um, one of the big disadvantages of corporations can go away with an S corporation. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so here we're back. We're, I guess, here we go. Yeah, here. So I'm going to skip on to the next slide. Sorry about that. Um, your study guide may be a little bit of out of order here. I'm not sure if the study guide's messed up here, too. So let's talk about an S corporation. Well, um, it is a corporation that is formed under federal law federal tax law, the IRS code, that isn't corporation, yet it's taxed like a partnership. Again, that pass-through taxation treatment. Now, people always talk about it being taxed like a partnership, and that's true, but it's not just a partnership. The LLC is taxed the same way. 
The sole proprietorship is taxed the same way. So we, we act like, oh, it's just like a partnership. Well, yeah, it is just like a partnership, but it's not the only thing that's taxed that way. Okay, so let's see how we get to be an S corporation. Okay, so we take a C corporation that is formed under relevant state law. And again, the C is just our way of distinguishing it from S corporation. And then we make that C corporation to an S corporation under federal law by following subchapter S of the IRS code. So what are the factors that allow us to make our C corporation to an S corporation? The big issue is how big is our corporation? If it's too big, uh, we're stuck being a C corporation. If we have no more than 100 shareholders though, we can perhaps become an S corporation. Once we get to 101, it's too late. Um, and of course, if it becomes an S corporation, then shareholders are gonna have to report the income from the S corporation on their personal income tax forms. So let's go back to our advantages and disadvantages. This one should have been um, after this. It was a little misordering here. Okay, so let's see the advantages of corporations. And this would include C and S. Okay, well, there's that limitation of liability. But again, we've seen that in lots of entities. You know, really, all three of these entities have, have had those characteristics. One, two, three, and then the corporation now. This is the one of the big advantages, though. It's easier to raise money because you can sell stock. The other entities can raise money by, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, creating more members or, or things along those lines, but nothing is as easy in, for this purpose as, as issuing stock. Um, so that's a, a distinction, I guess, from that perspective. Um, and profits are taxed as income to the shareholders, um, uh, which is a difference between a partnership. Um, but the disadvantage is that corporate C corporation owners are subject to double taxation. And this is another disadvantage, which we haven't talked about yet, but I just want to flag, is that there's a need for greater formalities, both in the creation of the corporation and its maintenance. Things like 10 Qs, annual reports, um, there's more formalities. And if you don't follow those formalities, it's possible that your corporation can go poof. Remember before we talked about how if you wanted to become, say, an LLP, but you didn't follow the paperwork, well, you don't become a limited liability partnership, you become a general partnership. Well, if you have a corporation and you don't follow all the paperwork, it's possible that you could become a general partnership if there's more than one owner or or if it's just one owner, you could become a sole proprietorship. Um, so you do want to be sure that you're following uh, the paperwork. And I would say if you're going to establish a corporation, you probably do want to get a CPA or an attorney involved. With the other entities, you don't need one. It's not wrong to get one, but it's not necessary. But once you get to the point, and, you, know, you might want a CPA to do your income tax returns if you have some of these other entities. But in terms of establishing the entity, um, you, you really uh, don't need a uh, professional. But once you get to a corporation, um, unless you are a very sophisticated uh, business person, you're going to want most likely to have a, a uh, either a accounting or, or legal professional. This this is uh, it's, it takes money, it takes organization, it takes uh, time to to do these formalities. There is a table in your book um, that kind of goes over this information. Um, what I would recommend that you do in prep for the test is to um, cover up all of the information in the blanks and just go through and, and try to fill in the blanks and then, um, you know, on a sheet of paper and then go back and see how close you were to the answers that the book provides. That can be a good way of confirming that you know the difference between an LLC, for example, and a partnership and a corporation, all of those cool things.
Okay, so we've gone through all of our entities now. We've talked about sole proprietorship, general partnership, limited partnership, limited liability partnership, limited liability company, and corporation. This is the main focus of our lecture, but we have just a few housekeeping matters to address before we conclude, and we're going to talk about just a few kind of quirky entities, not too much time on any of these things. A cooperative is an organization formed by individuals, and again, when we say individuals, we don't necessarily mean human beings, although we might mean human beings, but we also could be partnerships or corporations or LLCs, so some kind of entity to market new products. Individuals in a cooperative pool their resources to gain an advantage in the market. Imagine that I'm a farmer. I grow kumquats, um, and... Um, in my particular geographic area, there's lots of kumquat farmers. After all, if it's good weather, good soil for kumquats. For me, it's good soil and good weather for someone else to grow kumquats. We're really not so much competing against each other. What we're really hoping to do is increase market share. We want people to start thinking about buying kumquats instead of buying limes or lemons or some other fruit. And so we want to... Um, let's say, and I'm making up numbers here, let's say there's uh, $100 million sales in kumquats a year in the United States. We want that to become $200 million because that means I can sell twice as many kumquats and still maintain my market uh, share. Yeah, I mean, I probably would like to take more of the market share from somebody else, but mainly I'm interested in increasing the size of the pie, not increasing uh, my sliver size. So um, all of these kumquat farmers might go together and say, we need to have an advertising campaign. We're going to put a commercial on the TV, and that will make people uh, think kumquats are cool and awesome, and we'll tell them how to prepare them, and it will uh, make people excited about buying kumquats, and suddenly there'll be more kumquats in the grocery store because the various grocery stores will, will want to cater to these needs. Anyway, that's a way of increasing the size. That would be an example of a cooperative. I contributed money to the cooperative for this advertising campaign campaign, and so do all the other farmers. A joint, joint stock company is a business, let me just read the definition, is a partnership agreement in which business, in which company members hold transferable shares while all the company's goods are held in the names of the partners. This is somewhere, an entity somewhere between a partnership and a corporation. Historically, before the corporation was invented, this was a way of, of achieving some of the benefits of, of the corporate structure. Not a very common um, entity to have. Then we have a business trust. This is also kind of a bit of a different way um, to structure business. It's a business organization governed by a set of trustees who operate the trust for the beneficiaries. Again, it's somewhat similar to a corporation. The beneficiaries are like the stockholders. The trustees are like the board of directors of a corporation. What is a trustee? It's the person who operates a trust for the beneficiaries of a business trust. Let's look at the terms here. We see the EE and the trust is uh, for them. Not that they're the beneficiaries, but the trust was set up so that um, uh, they will uh, 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 comply with the trust. The trustor, which is a term you never hear, is the person who set up the trust and these are the people who are actually uh, fulfilling the trust. The beneficiary is the person who's going to benefit from the fresh. And you can see the word beneficiary. It's the beginning. looks like benefit. Kind of like a beneficiary, say, of a life insurance policy. The term syndicate, I think, oftentimes has kind of a... Uh, uh, negative connotation. I think we think of it associated with organized crime or something like that, but it doesn't inevitably have that meaning. A syndicate is an investment group that forms for the purpose of financing a specific large project. So let's imagine that um, uh, several uh, companies who uh, uh, make products along the Houston Ship Channel decide that uh, the ship channel needs to be enlarged so that bigger barges can come into the ship channel. And so they might together form this group to finance that improvement. Um, obviously, no one of those companies would be interested in paying for the a large project. After all, everyone would benefit from it, and they would end up having that one business would have to pay all the money. But you can see the benefits to having multiple uh, businesses come in and take care of that. Obviously, in some cases, the government might perform that function of, of increasing, say, a public good, such as like a port or something along those lines. A joint venture is basically a temporary partnership. It's an association between two or more 
persons or corporations or some other entity created for a specific business undertaking. It is a short-term partnership. Here's an example. This isn't a true story, but imagine for a second that Ford Motor Company, which is a corporation, decides it wants to design a special car uh, that will meet the particular business needs of Uber. And they, it, says, oh, it, says to Uber, Uber, it says to Uber, why don't you join us in this joint venture and we will have this car that we produce that will be especially well suited for the Uber business model. And we're just planning on, on doing this for a couple of years because you know, the business model will change over time. That would be an example of a joint venture, a short-term partnership. Obviously, Uber would have to agree to that, but let's assume that it did. Then that would be the joint venture. We're going to talk a little bit more in depth about franchises. Uh, franchises can be fairly interesting and cool devices um, for uh, small business owners to have. Many times this can be a smart way of becoming an entrepreneur. It um, gives you the opportunity to run your own business and to have that level of independence, but it also uh, gives you a little bit of a safety net, a little bit more um, uh, help in development and maintaining the business than you would have if you were running it completely independently. So what is a franchise? Well, it's a business arrangement between a franchisor and a franchisee. Well, who's a franchisor? That's the owner of the trademark or trade name of a franchise. So this is the person that has the model. Uh, we'll, for an example would be, you know, McDonald's, the big corporation. Most McDonald's restaurants, as you probably know, are not owned by the big corporation. They're owned by a much smaller entity, um, usually a local uh, family who uh, buys the franchise and um, they, be, they are the franchisee. They are the, a person, and again, it can be a, a human being, but more likely in the case of McDonald's, certainly, they would be a corporation or LLC who by specific terms of agreement sells goods or services under the trademark name or trade name or trademark of the franchise. So if I uh, go to McDonald's and say, hey, I'd like to open up a McDonald's restaurant and that territory is available and McDonald's approves uh, my purchase, I mean, obviously I'll have to pay them a certain amount of money and then I'll have to pay them royalties. I'll have to follow their business model. And But we, we work all that out. I build the, the restaurant and it, it looks like pretty much any other McDonald's. It's not going to be Groovers out front. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to be offering Big Macs and French fries and uh, shakes and uh, the products that McDonald's sells. Not, I'm not going to be offering, you know, Mexican food. I mean, uh, may, maybe there might be a few Mexican dishes, but I won't be offering uh, pizza or something like that unless McDonald's decides to start offering pizza. And we can see these suffixes as well. A franchisor is the one who makes the franchise. And the franchisees is the one who receives the franchise. And we see that you're, you're buying the franchise. You're not getting it as a gift. But again, we see those endings. So what are the advantages to the mom and pop who buys the franchise? Well, they're going to get some assistance from McDonald's. They're going to uh, be given a business model that's worked a lot of times. Um, they're going to be given advertising. They're going to be you know, told, well, this is how many fryers you need. This is how many cash registers you need. If you have this many cash registers, this is how many seats you need in the restaurant. This is how to staff the drive through These are the uh, where you ought to put um, your your uh, uh, various signage. Uh, this is uh, all those things that they have uh, had had, you know, teams of people think about and research and try this approach and that approach. You get all that wisdom immediately, but you also get it over the long haul. Also, you get name recognition. Imagine that I am driving down 75. I'm uh, going to, uh, we'll say I'm, I'm in Oklahoma somewhere, and I'm driving down the road. Actually, no, we'll say I'm driving down, I'm on 45, I'm driving down to Houston, and we're going through some small town, and I'm kind of thirsty or hungry, and I'm thinking, well, I'd, I'd like to stop and get something to eat. And anyway, I see that we're going to a town, and I actually see that there's 
a sign that says that there's there's food available right along the highway. Maybe I can even see um, the the signage from the from the highway. But anyway, I exit and I see two restaurants there. One is the Golden Arches. I see this in the um, in the uh, uh, you know in the distance, not too far, but I see it along the road. And then I see Groover's Restaurant. I have no idea what Groover's Restaurant is. It might be the best thing ever. But you know what? I know what McDonald's is. I know that I know what the menu is going to be like. I know how much it's going to cost. I know it's going to be pretty quick. Um, it's a safe bet. And um, Groover's might even be better or it might be as good, but it might also be worse. And so most of the time, or at least often, people are going to say, you know what, I'm not here to have fine dining. I'm here to have something quick. McDonald's is quick. I know what it is. Uh, I'm just going to go for that. You get that name recognition. You get that easy buy-in. Um, and so that's, a, that's a, a tremendous benefit for the case of McDonald's. Now, obviously, many, and that would apply to, to most of these products. Now, there are some products that there isn't that type of name recognition. So, uh, you know, the, the, the power of the franchise can vary depending upon the industry and the name recognition. And then, of course, the franchisor provides advertising per the contract. So, you know, again, when you see Ronald McDonald in an ad or they're running their Monopoly advertisement or they have a new McRib ad or something like that, all of that is designed to drive sales, um, get people thinking about, oh, you know what, I'd like a Big Mac or I'd like whatever, I'd like that new dish that they're doing. Um, and so... Uh, McDonald's is the, the big corporation is is um, inclined to do that um, in part because it's contractually required to do it but also they're getting a royalty um, from every time um, one of their franchises um, se uh, sells a burger or whatever plus McDonald's probably does own some portion of the McDonald's restaurants out there so we can see all the advantages to the mom-and-pop entity but there are some disadvantages. Uh, the franchisee may not want to follow all the contractual requirements. For example, a franchisee might be required to have a certain number of hours or a certain staffing level. Um, they may be restricted in, well, let's look at the next character. They may have very little creative control. I'll tell you a story about myself. I'm probably sharing more than I want to, but um, I don't really like McDonald's. I don't like hamburgers very much, and I really don't like french fries. I know that makes me rather strange, but um, here we go. Uh, but most of my family likes burgers, and so that's a favorite. Well, we go to Oklahoma a lot because my husband is from Oklahoma, so we visit um, his family. And um, there is a McDonald's uh, restaurant on the um, Indian Nations Turnpike, which is what 75 becomes during a stretch in Oklahoma. And um, at that McDonald's, not only do they have all of the standard menu items that you see in every other McDonald's, but they also have these awesome, awesome um, uh like large um, pretzels, like you might get it at Aunt Auntie Annie's or something like that. Uh, quite tasty. And so when we're going that way, we always stop at the McDonald's because it's a McDonald's I want to eat at. My, my husband and my children also want to eat there. It's a win-win. But I always think to myself, does corporate know that this particular franchise is, is uh, serving something off the menu? It may be that they're permitted to do that. It might be that they're pulling a fast one. I don't know. But that could be the type of thing that uh, the McDonald's franchise or uh, prohibits franchisees from doing. doesn't mean that every franchisee follows every single rule, but they're not supposed to veer from the rules, and that can cause uh, problems, and so they don't have a lot of control. If, if suddenly McDonald's suddenly wanted to say, well, we love all the, the, the Big Macs and things like that, but we also want to offer, you know, Chinese food and a pizza and um, uh, 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 Mexican food, in addition to all the regular uh, items that are in McDonald's menu, McDonald's would probably say, no, that's not our business model. Um, you can open up those restaurants. You just can't open them up into McDonald's because that's interfering with our brand 
identification. So it does cramp the style of some franchisees. So why does a franchisor want to use a franchise? Well, one advantage for the franchisor is that they can open up multiple locations for very little money. You know, usually if, if well, and this is not so much the case with McDonald's, but let's imagine that um, we were, well, we're a group of restaurants. We've opened up three or four group of restaurants. They've been successful. And now we're thinking about franchising where we're between, well, should we franchise it or should we open up, you know, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh restaurant? Well, if we franchise, then whomever we franchise to is going to be responsible for um, making that investment in the physical plant and the equipment and all those things. And then we'll get an income stream for that. It'll be a smaller income stream um, if the, the business is successful than it would be if we had opened it ourselves, because obviously it's just a percentage of the sales. But we can suddenly open up a lot more because if we had to open up all those restaurants, then we, would, uh, we wouldn't have a sufficient amount of capital to do that. So that's a big factor. There's less investment and there's less um, risk because after all, if, if that other franchise doesn't work out, well, you lose that income stream. You're not going to get all of those um, uh, royalties, but it's the franchisee who's lost his shirt, who's lost his investment, the franchisor has just lost the income stream, but he isn't, he didn't make any investment into the business. And of course the franchisor is going to get those increased royalties and usually royalties are based upon the income, not the profitability of the corporation. So you could have a situation where the franchisee is losing money, but is selling some hamburgers. And so the franchisor is still earning money off of that arrangement, even when the franchisee is losing money. Let's look at some disadvantages. Um, one is that um, the franchisees, excuse me, franchisors control of the franchise is not as complete as it would be if he actually owned the business. Now, certainly this can vary based upon the contract. They, there can be a lot of tight controls upon the franchisee, but there doesn't always follow that, that that's going to be the case. And so if you've worked hard uh, to cultivate a certain image of your restaurant, it could be that the, that image could be undermined based upon um, the activities of your franchisee. Uh, let's say, for example, that you have really kind of cultivated a wholesome image for your particular uh, restaurant, and suddenly your franchisee is um, uh, doing all kinds of things that uh, you don't think of as being as wholesome, but you can't find anything in the contract that they are actually violating. Well, if the a franchisee were the were not a franchisee but were your employee you could just go ahead and fire him and hire somebody that had more of the um, philosophy that you had but when it's a franchisee you're going to have to point to something in the contract that they are violating this last one is probably a growing concern i was listening to npr the other day and there was an, uh, an article about how this is a very significant concern for franchisors and also sometimes for franchisees. Uh, it can go both ways, but probably the bigger concern is with the franchisor. So let's go back to the example. Uh, we're McDonald's. McDonald's um, is a large corporation. It's got, I'm sure, many HR professionals and all kinds of policies that are designed to make sure that it complies with various employment laws, for example. It um, sells these franchises to franchisees, and these franchisees, I mean, they're not tiny businesses. I'm sure it, it costs several million dollars to buy a McDonald's franchise. But, you know, at any given time, maybe these uh, uh, restaurants might have staffs of 10 or 20 people. They're not huge operations. There certainly would not ordinarily, especially if it's if that franchisee owns a single location, it wouldn't be typical for that franchisee to um, have, say, a person who is completely devoted only to HR matters. No, you're going to have um, your managers uh, cover lots of different responsibilities, and so no one is an HR expert. Well, when you don't have somebody who is committed to a particular discipline, things that us fall through the crack. Uh, certain rules aren't followed. Uh, the corporate uh, 
employees, they're going to be, the rules are going to be followed with respect to them most likely because there is that staffing possibility. So let's say I go to work for a McDonald's franchise and uh, that business violates some law. Perhaps it um, doesn't provide a safe work environment for me or discriminates against me because of my age or my religion or my uh, gender um, or something along those lines. Well, I can obviously sue my employer, the franchisee, but I'd really probably like to sue McDonald's even more because after all, McDonald's is a deeper pocket. It has more money. And so that would be a more advantageous entity to sue. Now, McDonald's will say, wait a second, Gruber, we didn't hire you. That was that entity over there. We're separate and we don't know whether they discriminated against you or not. We can't speak to that, but we do know that, uh, you know, we, do, we don't discriminate against people, and we certainly did not encourage the franchisee to discriminate. In fact, we encourage them not to discriminate. And so whatever's going on between you and your former employer, that's y'all's business. We're not going to get involved, and we don't want to be sued about it. Um, that's how the rules used to be for a very long time, but over time there's been some creep here and it's becoming a little bit more common for the big corporation or the big franchisor sometimes to be sucked into that litigation. And the way that that can happen is when the franchisor has been a bit of a micromanager in certain aspects of the business. So the more that it gets involved in the minutia of the business, the more likely it is that the uh, the courts will say, well, if you got that involved in business, you should have gotten enough involved in business to stop this particular other behavior from occurring. So there's definitely a balance. Corporations who are franchisors have to decide how much is too much management. Um, there's, there's positives and there, there's negatives with both. And so it's kind of a fine line for them to consider. Okay, well, let's look at three different categories of franchises. The first two are going to be very, I think, familiar to most of us. We have the chain style business operation. The classic example of this would be fast foods, McDonald's, Burger King, um, In-N-Out Burger. I mean, there's lots of them. And in this case, the, franchise offers, uh, uh, the franchisee operates under the name of the franchisor's business, in this case, McDonald's. And of course, it has to follow the methods of a business operation that the franchisor has established. It's not restricted to restaurants. It can be lots of other things too, but that's the notion. It's a chain of, of these particular entities. Another example of a franchise is the distributorship. And the example for this is going to be Ford, a car dealership. So in this case, um, Ford, which is uh, you know the, the 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 manufacturer franchises its um, uh, uh, way means of selling the vehicle. So it franchises or in this sense licenses dealers to sell their products. So they have some kind of exclusive arrangement, exclusive territory. And under those circumstances, if you want to buy a Ford car, you have to, or if you want to buy a Ford dealership, you're obviously going to have to work through Ford. The last, the manufacturing arrangement is a little bit less common, and this is when uh, the franchisor has a particular method or formula uh, to manufacture items, and they provide that to the franchisee so the franchisee can uh, be engaged in that business. Let me just show you an example of that. Here we go. An example would be Sinorama. Sinorama is a franchise that um, they make signs and banners and decals and things like that um, so that businesses can advertise their business in that way. And so you go to Sinorama when you, maybe you're just starting out your business and you say, hey, I need to have these particular signs and then Sinorama makes it for you, makes that for you. Uh, Sinorama itself is a franchise, and so if you wanted to get into the sign making business, you could sign up with, with Sinorama and, and get your particular territory. And so they would tell you this is how to go about, this is the equipment that you need, this is how you go about marketing your, your particular business and, and, and how to approach that particular business model. So that's kind of an example of a manufacturing arrangement. Okay, so let's talk about the franchise agreement. This is a pretty regulated uh, situation under federal law. And in this situation, a franchise agreement is just a contract. You can see uh, the word uh, agreement is one of the 
elements of a contract. So when you see contract, when you see the word agreement, it is oftentimes a contract. These terms are closely related. So a franchise agreement is a contract in which a company, in this case the franchisor, you know, like McDonald's in other words, grants permission to another party, the franchisee, the mom and pop, to use the franchisor's name, trademark or copyright in the operation of business and associate sales of goods in return for payment. So the fran so McDonald's says you can use our name as long as you pay us and all the specifics about how you need to con contract or conduct that business. So typical provisions are going to be what's the upfront payment that the franchisee, the mom and pop has to pay the franchisor and what are the royalty payments? Usually that, those will be paid um, every month. Where is the location of the business? And if there isn't a physical location, what is the um, uh, territory of that particular business? And then finally, a description of what are the permitted and required business practices, what are the practices that perhaps are not permitted. And so those are the types of information you would expect to find in a franchise agreement. Um, so we have now concluded our Chapter 21 lecture. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email, come to my office hours, or raise those questions in class. Um, uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, have a great day.